Welcome back, everybody. Our next presenter is David Sarita. I don't know how many of you know David. Um, he's a pretty public figure at this point. But he had his first UFO sighting at the old age of seven years old. But when he grew up, he went on to become a space scientist with a, a bent toward human consciousness and spirituality. David has been uh, public in the UFO field and the UFO connections to all of this since about 2000. Uh, in 1993, he did address Congress on nuclear fusion. But most of all, David is a, is a man with a heart about this big, a pure heart. And right now, his concern and his effort is focused on ways to save the planet, and most especially ways to save all of us. Please welcome David Sarita. Um, am I plugged in? I'm plugged in. Well, I wanted to start by saying thank you for all of you to lend your minds and your ears. And it's like being in UFO University here. You know, for seven days, you're, you're taking all these courses, and they're really long, and you guys have this incredible ability to have such a long attention span and focus on very concentrated work. And I wish we could abduct all the members of Obama's Congress and make them come to the UFO Congress for the full week, and then they'll know the truth. And thank you, Bob, and your family for having me here this year. It's really an honor. This is uh, my favorite um, convention. Well, my talk today is about reverse engineer the truth about alien technology. And the significance of this technology, to me, is having been an ecologist for over you know, 25 years and personally planted over a million and a quarter trees myself in uh, springs and summers for 22 years in British Columbia, I also worked in nuclear fusion for 10 years, and I was around Nobel Prize winners like Murray Gelman, Glenn Seaborg, who chaired the Atomic Energy Commission. And we were working towards the goal of environmentally clean fusion energy and had huge barriers at the congressional level. Even despite signatures from dozens of Nobel Prize winners, we couldn't complete the project and get all the funding. And so that all ended. I went on to bomb detection, landmine and bomb detection for Department of Defense, and before 9-11, and so I got a lot of experience in, in, in the field of physics detection. And meanwhile, in the background, I, was, I spent six years talking to NASA's top scientists. I got to know a lot of them through my, my various jobs and had a dialogue with them about UFOs. In fact, where my, I saw my first UFO at Berkeley in 1968. I was um, seven years old. And uh, let's just fast forward here to what I looked like at seven. Where am I here? There I am. Um, and what happened as I was walking home from school is, is there's this flying saucer and there's a pandemonium of excitement. People were pointing up at the sky and looking at this thing. And what happened to me that day was that, you know, after watching this thing for a full 20 minutes, and it, it looked like the Billy Meyer ship, if all of you know what, you know, Billy Meyer felt, was down low near the campus. This was the time during the riots, you know, the big movements against Vietnam. And my father was getting his PhD in psychology. And right up on the hill, unbeknownst to me, was Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where decades later, I would have lunch with Glenn Seaborg, who chaired the Atomic Energy Commission under Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, and tell him that I saw a flying saucer there. And, and we, so we had some discussions about it. So, you know, cameras back then were better than digital cameras today. There, there are a lot of qualities in these old cameras. So um, what I want to start with now is I actually ended up quite recently scouring the many 2,700 pages of the FBI FOIA Real X files under J. Edgar Hoover, and I found something I don't know how many people were aware of, but many children were test flying toy flying saucers that were using anti-gravity on July the 8th and the 9th of 1947, the same day as the Roswell crash. And these saucers really flew. So let's play uh, video clip number one, please. It Trevor James Constable, a New Zealand 
naval radar operator in World War II, was the pioneer of invisible photography. In the 1950s in California, Trevor took these amazing photographs of UFOs over Landers, Giant Rock, California, where George Van Tassel was channeling extraterrestrials. The photos are so stunning to me because they show translucent disks of white UFOs with dark holes in the center, identical to the NASA STS-75 UFOs from the space shuttle in 1996, in February 1996. So we have the same UFOs confirmed from two different sources over 40 years apart. So if you look at very closely what's going on, NASA is saying that these are pieces of debris floating right in front of the camera lens and as they get in front of the lens you get these fuzzy orbs of light called airy disks around them and giving the illusion they're UFOs. But if they were really that close to the camera, as NASA contends, how would they survive a long zoom? I did a very simple test with a digital camera, just like they're using, you hold a dime, which is bigger than any piece of dust you could find, and you hold it even a couple of inches or six inches in front of the camera. When you zoom in, you can't even see the dime. It disappears completely. And NASA's cameras zoom all the way in on the tether, which is you know, 77 to 100 miles away from the camera, and the objects are still there. There's no way these are pieces of debris that are near the camera lens. There's no way, which confirms that they're actually as large as we say they are. They're passing behind the tether. The tether is 12 miles long. The UFOs are two to three miles wide in diameter, one to three miles in, in diameter, if they're right behind the tether. If they're further behind the tether than we think, they are much larger than that. And second, I confirmed with Dr. Joseph Newth III at NASA that NASA's video cameras can see into the near ultraviolet and the far ultraviolet, which is two bandwidths of ultraviolet into the invisible spectrum where human eyes don't see. On July 9th, 1947, there was an incident in North Hollywood, in Hollywood, California, where people saw a flying saucer crash into this woman's yard and burst into flames. This is roughly the same time as the Roswell incident, which is roughly the, you know, the week of July 7th through the 10th or the 9th of 1947. So a flying saucer crashes in Los Angeles. But what's amazing about the case, which is now listed under the Freedom of Information Act request on the FBI's website, this is a real case. What you're about to see are real photographs. They retrieve the flying saucer and it's only 30 inches in diameter, 30 inches and it's made of aluminum. And what really got my attention is that when you look at this thing, when they cut it in half and they opened it up, it's got a V-shaped notch and a black hole in the center. And if you look at the NASA STS-75 UFO, which I estimated two to three miles wide, it looks identically the same on, on the cameras. They can see into the invisible ultraviolet. You can see a dark hole in the center. You can see these strobing waves coming out of it. And you can see this notch cut out of the side of it. I mean, it, it's really quite remarkable. But when we actually look at what was found inside the craft, when we read the actual FBI documents, <clears throat> it says on the evening of July the 9th, 1947, a report was received in the Los Angeles office that a so-called flying disc had landed in the vicinity of Redford and Magnolia Streets in North Hollywood, California, and described it as approximately 30 inches in diameter. It weighed about 22 pounds. And in fact, we even have the address here of where it crashed, 11858 Magnolia Boulevard, North Hollywood. I mean, this is a very detailed report. But when they took the flying saucer and they cut it in half, and you look at these photographs, they found that it had a radio tube it mounted in the center. So this thing was producing some kind of a magnetic field or some kind of waves and produced anti-gravity. And they claimed when the FBI actually researched this, a bunch of kids claim that they were actually, it was an experiment. Kids, this is what they're claiming in this FBI report. I mean, 16 years old. This kid was 16 years old. He said he built this thing. And when you really look at it, if a 16 year old kid could build a flying saucer in 1947, the same day as the Roswell crash, where did he get the information? Was he having telepathic dreams? You know, in the, in the last couple of months, and he decides to build this thing. Is 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 this really not? Uh, you know, this is really an, an extraterrestrial satellite that's connected to the main crash uh, craft at Roswell. And when the craft at Roswell crashes down on the ground, it loses contact with its satellite, the little probe, and they both crash. But why a 16-year-old kid? Why is a 16-year-old kid claiming this? And if a 16-year-old kid did this, where is he today? Where is anti-gravity research today? And then, why aluminum? 
is there something about aluminum that interacting with electromagnetic fields that causes anti-gravity? When we look at Boyd Bushman, the Lockheed senior research scientist, he actually shows us an experiment and he tells us that both copper and aluminum, when they're interfaced with certain electromagnetic fields and magnetism, produces anti-gravity. The point in um, showing that uh, piece of video from my From Here to Andromeda DVD is there were actually quite a number of reports in the FBI files of children, and this is pre-internet days, who built aluminum flying saucers with radio tubes in the middle, and they actually produced anti-gravity. And I would just imagine that Department of Defense would probably abduct all of those kids, and they would be working for Department of Defense, and nobody knows about you know, where they ended up. But what interested me is, you know, why children? And of course, this would make a fantastic Steven Spielberg movie. Um, little kids getting downloaded information. Well, the same thing happened to me, but I wasn't 16. I was seven. And what I saw in the pursuing weeks um, in Berkeley were visions and dreams that I saw one set of lights, uh, blue, green, spinning one way, clockwise, and then a kind of red, orange, spinning counterclockwise on the same axis. And deeper than that, I was downloaded at how the anti-gravity actually worked. And instead of becoming a psychologist like my father who got a PhD at Berkeley and my mom a lawyer, I wanted the answer to my UFO experience. I wanted to know what was going on here. I could not fall down the straight and narrow. And I got answers. It took me my whole life to eventually figure out that green and blue lights are a shorter wavelength than red and orange, and that between the clockwise and anti-clockwise pairs was something called a differential. And what interests me also about the NASA UFO, you know, if people say these are out of focus orbs, I, I, I gave two arguments why when you pan through the window on the airplane with the little ice crystals, you can't even see them anymore. And, and NASA's arguments were that, you know, little pieces of uh, cookie crumbs or whatever were floating around the shuttle, the camera zooms through them and, and you get little orbs around them. But with those airy disks, nothing is in focus. I've seen them. They're truly out of focus. So why the Fibonacci spiral in the waveform, which you're seeing here? How did that show up? And so that begins a very, very deep investigation into a discovery that will, that is actually quite amazing into what we call differentials. Can we um, actually play video clip number two before we go to this? In crop circles, you have one lay of grass spinning clockwise and one lay of grass spinning anticlockwise. I'm Barbara Lamb, and I have been researching crop circles in England since 1990. So at this point, I've had 16 consecutive summers of crop circle research in England. I've been into literally hundreds of crop circles during those years, and I am particularly interested in the lay of the crops right down there on the ground, as well as the overhead view of the crop circles. In this particular crop circle, in early August, in a place called Garsington, Oxfordshire, England, it was a very interesting <coughs> spiraling of the crop, the wheat crop. You've got this portion spiraling along in a raised aspect. This is spiraling in a counterclockwise direction. But in the center of that portion of the circle, the crop is spiraling in a clockwise direction. And around the raised ridge, this crop circle is spiraling in a clockwise. So you have clockwise, counterclockwise, and clockwise again, all in the same circle of a larger formation. In this crop circle formed the night of July 27, 2005, at a place called Avebury Manor in Wiltshire County, England, was this extraordinary formation, which is called a quinquux or quintuplet formation with the center circle and the four satellite circles 
and even more satellite circles, all in very even proportion. The extraordinary feature about this on the ground is that in the center circle, the wheat is laid perfectly evenly in a clockwise direction. However, there's also a band of other circles laid within that very same circle, and these 19 circles are laid in a counterclockwise direction. In that same center circle, the band or the row of counterclockwise circles is depicted here with details counterclockwise, 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 and so on all around in this extra band of counterclockwise circles within the clockwise larger circle. If we look at this first crop circle, we can see that this literally looks like a flying saucer. I mean, it's disc shape, it has this three-dimensional quality, and as we look inside of it, we can see it's almost as if a lid is lifted off the top of the saucer to reveal what is inside. I believe, after studying the effects of subatomic particles in bubble chambers, that we are seeing a language in crop circles that is, that is reminiscent of quantum physics. There, the language is actually teaching us how to transform mass, cancel out gravity, produce anti-gravity, and eventually travel faster than the speed of light to visit other star systems. I literally believe that that's what the message is. Uh, yeah, I think we, we might, we'll play the next clip in a moment. So this is kind of like wax on, wax off in the Karate Kid. You know, why were you learning about clockwise, anti-clockwise? I'm going to take you so deep into this by the end. And the grand finale in the end, we're going to examine um, videography of UFOs, where certain frames in the video you can see right through the UFO. This is Jeff Willey's footage. And we're going to see evidence of this. And we're also going to meet Boyd Bushman, a Lockheed Martin senior scientist, of 20 years who designed the Stinger missile, which was called Red Eye for General Dynamics, who I was lucky enough to get an interview with because he had been following the works of John Hutchison in Canada, who was able to levitate giant cannonballs and also all sorts of amazing objects using Tesla technology, waves that have certain configurations and patterns. And Boyd Bushman ends up can basically testifying that we shot down the Roswell Flying Saucer with a classified super weapon, which hopefully we'll get to that near the end, and reverse engineered the technology. There were aliens inside. He is, he is um, in fact, if you do this exercise yourself, he's not like um, Bob Lazar, which, and, and actually he's friends with Bob Lazar. If you search him on the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Boyd Bush Man, you'll find all of his patents, and they all say Lockheed Martin on him. So he is the real deal. He's got uh, missiles that can pull 800 Gs on the turns because they, they have actually are using reverse engineered um, UFO technology. But the key is in the counter rotational spins and how they're configured. So my paper called Differentials, the Hidden Harmonic Codes of the Universe, will reveal this secret to not only anti-gravity but zero point energy and things we can't even imagine. So what I did is, this, was, this actually goes back to my evidence the case for NASA UFOs videos, I got tired of looking at wave models in just two dimensions, of just on a sheet of paper. You only have height and width. You don't have depth. So I invented something called a galaxy clock that can measure everything from the orbit of planets around a star to the orbits of subatomic particles. And for those of you who are really familiar with crop circles, you'll start to see a familiarity here in the patterns of the way some of these subatomic particles move. But I quickly, and of course, the way galaxies actually form. That's my phase two galaxy clock on the left. But without going into that, because that's an enormous exercise, I started looking for something called differentials. Newton's third law says that every action, if I move my hand, will meet an equal and opposite reaction. And I didn't believe that, having studied you know, quantum mechanics and physics for over 20 years now that there had to be something called differentials, which are vibrations that are left over energies when two forces compete with each other. In fact, if you, you know, draw a circle clockwise with your hand, this actually looks counterclockwise to you because of where we're facing, 
if another wave meets this wave and they're both spinning the same direction, you don't get any friction, so you don't get any vibration. But actually, what I found is everywhere there were these counter-rotational spins that as they move against each other, they produce vibration. And this is a NASA three-dimensional model. This was actually a movie of our Earth and, and some of the hidden fields. The purple toroid cross-section is the familiar Van Allen radiation belts. They're spinning counterclockwise while the green belt, known as the plasma pause, spins clockwise. And the gray belt, uh, no, the green is the plasma pause, the purple is the Van Allen, right. And then there's the gray lines, which are also, they're all going counter-rotational. But notice they all have different diameters and wavelengths. The green one is much larger of a loop than the purple one. Which means as those fields vibrate across each other, they produce vibrational energy patterns, but there's a leftover energy. And I thought, you know, this all goes back to my experience in the UFO, the counter-rotational spins. This, this particular paper, for people who are really interested in it, um, you can purchase it after the, sh the show at my booth. But even an ocean wave. For an ocean wave to curl, you, let's say this wave here in my hand is moving at five miles an hour this way, and this wave is moving at six miles an hour this way. When they collide, you have one more one mile an hour going this way left over. That's called a differential, or leftover force. And that's why the wave curls. And I notice these things everywhere. The spiral arms on galaxies do not have the same wavelengths. And this is where I got into a big argument with one of the top quantum physicists in the world who wrote the book, The Particle Odyssey. This is kind of my Bible. For anybody who studies crop circles, you must read The Particle Odyssey. You're going to see the language of quantum mechanics revealing itself to you. This is a, a photo in a bubble chamber where they explode subatomic particles at near the speed of light and they explode them in these cloud chambers. And just like if you throw a pebble through a cloud bank, it'll leave a little trail as the cloud moves away, as the rock is going through it. And they photograph the trails. So the pink trail you see there, I hope you can see that, is a shorter wavelength, meaning it's going to make an oscillation sooner than the white one, which is its counter particle. Which means when you compare the two of them together, when they compete with each other, there's a differential or a leftover, just like in the water. And when I wrote Frank, Frank Close about this, he said, well, that's only one photo. Um, it's got to be a coincidence. And I said, well, here's another photo. where you, you can, It's pretty obvious, actually. You can see that they don't have the same wavelengths. Well, these little particles, I believe, are the language that, are, that is actually in a lot of the crop circle messages. And um, as Barbara Lamb pointed out, you can see the clockwise, anti-clockwise weaves, but if you notice really closely, if you measure the radius from the center of the circle to the outer rim, they both have a slightly different wavelength or radius, meaning one has a radius in the center of the circle here, and the other one is here, and they're on top of each other. And over and over and over again, I started finding these differentials in the quantum universe. And here's another example. The positron is red and the electron is is yellow, and they're actually really the same particle. Called an, every particle has an antiparticle. And I started measuring the diameters of these and comparing the ratios to see if there were hidden harmonic codes, something beyond frequency. Beyond frequency that could be the secret to zero-point energy and even anti-gravity. This photo shows um, what we would think is a Fibonacci, for those of you who know the Fibonacci um, ratio, spiraling uh, waveform. It actually isn't Fibonacci. I ended up doing some amazing math on this. And what I did here, if you take, um, if you can see the, the um, pink line at the bottom in the turquoise line, I divide them into each other clockwise and anti-clockwise. And the numbers I generate are 1.1111111. That's called a harmonic ratio between the two. Now, why 1.1111? Why not 1.692492? Like chaos. Why such perfect harmony? And as you'll see as we go along, because we're going to meet Boyd Bushman at Lockheed, this is, getting, this is getting to the secret to how these UFOs fly. This is the language, in my opinion, of the crop circles. Now, I did a whole bunch of math on some of these guys, um, and I ended up dividing, um, I actually ended up challenging the golden mean. You know, the golden rectangle, you have um, the height, 
the, the length of the, tri of the rectangle is 1.618, that of its height. And I ended up doing all of this math to find out if there really is such a thing as a perfect golden mean. And it turns out there isn't. You never really get there. And I'm going to skip by some of this math because I want to get to um, my point much sooner than going through all the math. Now, th this is an example of, the f of a, a proof on our own planet that we don't live on a true sphere. The diameter of the Earth, which is the distance through the center, pole to pole, is shorter than the diameter of the equator. And now if you spin those two waves against each other, you will get what's called a leftover number, which is actually harmonic. It's actually like a hum. It has a vibration. Archimedes was considered the greatest scientist in antiquity. From the third century BC, he is really the father of modern physics. And I actually ended up finding out about Archimedes and his accidental discovery of differentials after I had written my entire paper, my friend Luke um, Gatto introduced me to this book, The Archimedes Codex. The Archimedes Codex sold for $2 million at a Christie's auction in New York, made the front page of the New York Times, and hardly anybody ever heard of it. It was the first time we had an actual copy of Archimedes' work. And what Archimedes did, he was the first one, if you look at the lower circle, um, actually I think my little mouse here, yeah, this guy right in here. From the radius, from the center of the circle to the perimeter, he was the first one to define the inner and the outer circle. If you look at E, E is the outer circle radius, and then if you look at Z, it's the inner circle radius. But he didn't put it in a differential language. And what interests me about Archimedes is he tries to do something called squaring the circle. He takes your half a circle and he fills it with infinite triangles. If you look at the, the arc on the bottom, he just packs triangles, and what's amazing is he opened something called infinities, that a circle could never be squared. No matter how many triangles you packed into the tiniest spaces, there would be, always be something called a leftover space towards infinity. I was so excited because I realized I knew what this was. This was a differential. And Archimedes is actually the father of pi, which, of course, we take the diameter of a circle times pi, and we're supposed to get the circumference of the circle. I'm going to show you an amazing mind puzzle. Because Archimedes admitted that pi was, uh, let me just find it here, was smaller than that of uh, 14,688 in ratio to 4,673.5, but greater than that of 6,336 to 2,117. These are harmonic ratios. He couldn't find, he couldn't resolve the circle. And this, this, what I'm about to show you, is an incredible mind puzzle. You draw a line with any thickness, and you realize that no matter, my line is 100 centimeters long on both sides. And you can do this at any length you want, and you will not be able to, this is a real trick to solve. If, as soon as I make a circle out of it, I have an inner and an outer circle. You're going to understand how this relates to crop circles and UFOs um, very clearly. Now, when I measure the inner and the outer circle radius, and I multiply that by pi, 3.14, etc., I get two different numbers. But I started with the same number on side A and B. How, did, how the heck did that happen? How do you solve this problem? Why did the inner circle have a shorter um, length than the outer circle? Well, this is part of, this all goes back to Archimedes. No matter how small I draw my line and I make a circle out of it, I'm always going to have an inner and outer circle. And what we find is in the invisible, even looking at our planet that looks like a sphere, if you include the invisible waveform around the planet, there is no such thing as a, as a sphere that doesn't have an opening to allow energy to come into the circle and to leave the circle. This is the way electrons actually spiral in the quantum universe. And you'll notice there's all these different gaps as the electron spirals, spirals along. Those are openings. Now, this is a very complicated subject which involves Cherenkov radiation. When you move light faster than it can normally travel through water or through glass or any medium that tends to slow it down, it emits a form of radiation. And I noticed that it's forming a vesica Pisces. How many people know the vesica Pisces shape? Um, when two spheres come together, in, in the space between, you get the shape of a fish or the vesica Pisces. 
And that's proof that actually there are two waveforms at work here to produce this, this shape. So this is actually what a true circle should look like with a little opening at the top. And in the background, you can actually see the spiraling motion of electrons. So when you look at any shape, a square, a cube, or the spiraling motion of the way um, electrons spin around protons on the, on the left, you, can, you now have this awareness of the inner dimension of the circles and the loops and the outer. And that between them, there is a harmony that produces what are called differential vibrations. Even if we look at a sine wave on the left, or the radius from the center of an atom to the outer rim of it, we can see there's something that no one else has ever seen. Now this is, for those of you who like crop circles, this is, this is really going to come slamming together. This is my swimming pool. And there's more going on in your swimming pool than you can possibly imagine, which um, you're going to see here. There was nobody in the swimming pool that day. And my wife Crystal and I, you know, I started to notice these little bubbles and spinning vortexes on the bottom of the pool. And there's, you know, there's no wind and it's very smooth. And I went, oh my god, look what those things are doing. Um, so let's start by playing, I'm gonna, first I'm going to show you the movie. And in the movie of the vortex, which is only one minute, remember the crop circle has the counterclockwise right on top of each other. You'll see the black spiraling like Milky Way galaxy spinning counterclockwise. And over time, you're going to see a bright radial line spinning clockwise right on top of it. And then it's going to start forming sacred geometries in the differential space. So can we play a water vortex, please? Oh, it's kind of skipping a little bit. Now look at 9 o'clock. Now you see those bright lines. It's in kind of in slow mo here. And the bright lines start to emerge, and a lot of interference patterns form at 9 o'clock. Don't worry, I'm going to show you this frame by frame. And right on top of the counterclockwise, we'll start to see bright lines that will be spinning clockwise. Um, it normally doesn't play like this, and it's actually in, somehow in slow motion here. Now, there's your bright radial lines now forming at 9 o'clock, and they're all spin. They're all spin they're all, actually, it's hard to see the way it's um, framed like this, um, but it's almost over. I'll show you the still images. Yeah, okay. Let's go back to the slideshow. So the first thing I noticed is, of course, you see the, um, the spiraling. It reminds you of the Milky Way galaxy kind of spinning. And you have this kind of black hole you know, effect in the middle. And if you look right, ar you know, right around here, you'll notice the colors a little bit of the rainbow. Prism. Wormholes are not feasible. They're pie in the sky the physics. A, a wormhole requires the negative energy, a negative energy deficit of 100 million suns for an entire year. There are 100 million suns in the Milky Way galaxy. These little, these bright radial lines start to emerge, and I get little wiggles right here at 9 o'clock, and that's where things start to get really amazing. We see the beginning of a Vesica Pisces, and this is a Vesica Pisces when two spheres come together you get this new shape in the middle. And there are many um, physicists who believe in sacred geometry um, professionals that the, the Big Bang actually was not a single sphere, but two spheres that formed the Vesica Pisces and created the universe. Now suddenly, you know, if we look at the previous image, look how smooth the edges of the black hole are here. But then our clockwise wave jumps out and starts wiggling and producing interference patterns right here at 9 o'clock. You're not going to believe what's going to happen over time here. Now, we're starting to see hexagonal, not a, a circle, slight hexagonal lines, and we got a baseball diamond in the middle. And we got blue light over here and kind of warm light over here, which is interesting. Now we get a full Vesica Pisces that suddenly emerges on the, on the seventh slide. And it's interesting to note that a Vesica Pisces height by its width in here, this is the height and the width, the ratio is 265 to 153. Jesus caught 153 fish in the Gospel of John, 2111. Why 153? Is that, is, is he speaking in a language of harmonic differentials? Because we know the fish emerges out of the shape of the Vesca Pisces. If the tail was up here, you know, here's the body of the fish. Why, did, why 153 fish? Why not just 150? 
I mean, probably he was speaking in a language far ahead of his time that the secret to manifesting anything, energy, how the yogis in India manifest food, palaces, stones, out of, their, out of the thin air, is they knew these secret harmonic codes, something beyond frequency. Harmonic codes are when different frequencies come together, counter-rotational to each other, and they vibrate in sets in perfect harmony. As opposed to, let's say we were um, the Beatles rock and roll band, and I wanted to sing for them, and I ruined the entire harmony. I would be out of harmony. You, every single one of these waveforms is in a perfect harmony, and as they overlap, they produce harmonic codes. And those codes have meaning, very profound meaning. I'm doing incredible experiments on this in my lab. Now this really blew my mind, because if you look at 9 o'clock over here, we have a cube, a diamond, a cube again, and a rectangle, and then we got this blob over here. And in the, notice the middle, the, not, the spiraling vortex has separated itself off. That's because the clockwise, counterclockwise waves in here have actually created shapes, architectures. How the heck did that happen in a swimming pool? And why, in crop circles, the counter-rotating fields produce all these sacred geometries? It's the hidden harmonic codes that do this. There is intelligence behind the crop circles, but it's the counter-rotational spins that because they're pulsed as the waves hit each other, they produce shapes, geometries, and they emerge in a pool of water. And then, of course, here we can see all kinds of interesting shapes, you know, slices of a pie. Um, and here, if you can see in three-dimensionally, adjust your eyes, we have a donut, a toroid, almost in three-dimensional space. You know, here's the hole in the middle of the donut, and here's the rim. All these geometries appearing because of counter-rotational spins. And here, by the time the, the, the interference patterns got very evolved, we've got in the middle, if you can see it in here very faintly, it's a pentagon, which is kind of weaved inner and outer with all of our different shapes on the outer rim. So that's just the beginning. How do we get to the secret to anti-gravity? How do we get to understand that this is actually the secret and the language hidden in the crop circles? Um, let's play the next uh, video, please. Wormholes are not feasible. They're pie in the sky physics. A wormhole requires the negative energy, a negative energy deficit of 100 million suns for an entire year. There are 100 million suns in the Milky Way galaxy, our whole galaxy. You have to extract all of their negative energy for a whole year to make one wormhole big enough to fit a quarter through. What civilization is going to access all of that energy to make one wormhole to fit a quarter through? And if you want to fit your whole body through the wormhole, and then your whole family, and teleport to another dimension, you're going to need the negative energy of multiple galaxies. This is not how they are doing it. This is like a caveman banging his head against the wall and saying, I'm going to get through the other side of that wall if I have to smash my way through it. Wormholes don't work. Wake up, people. You have to find out how this is happening. We have to find out how to get to Andromeda, and we're never going to get there with drawing pictures of wormholes and, and telling ourselves that we have to attain the negative energy of hundreds of millions of suns. This is not how they are doing it. They are doing it by transforming the mass of their spacecraft, and they're getting out of space. A lot of people are doing nothing more than getting huge, huge quantities of mass and see if they can get a, a gravity wave to cause things to move. Mm -hmm. Well, that isn't what, what we're talking about at all. Mm -hmm. So I uh, wondered if gravity could be uh, related to its cousin magnetism. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I found that when I take two magnets together, I have some neodymiums around here that I'm actually afraid of. They, They're they so can, strong. They can, they can danger you. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, you take a magnet, you go to put them together and go, and they go clunk, right? Mm -hmm. But you take one of them, move it around, and all of a sudden it doesn't want to yeah, go right. together. Yeah, right, the repulsive. So I, got, uh, I, ha I ordered one at $5,000 a piece. Wow. With, with with a quarter inch hole through between both of them, and I put a brass bolt and I tightened them down, forcing them together. Mm -hmm. And then I put them together in a thing that looks kind of like a rock. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I got another one that didn't have magnets 
in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Galileo, in, in all his endeavors, he went up to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And dropped the... And he dropped a big rock and a small rock. Mm -hmm. And his buddy down at the bottom kept telling him that the large rock, rock and the small rock arrived at the same time. Building 501 mm. by the side of escalators and, and elevators. Oh, wow. And I got, I got, uh, I got, I got uh, nine guys that were not educated and didn't have pre, <laughs> didn't have pre opinions on anything. Mm. And I dropped my two rocks. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, What I would like you to do is, I told them what I'd like you to do is, I would like you to take. Whichever one arrives first, get it in your hand, and when I come down the elevator, hand it to me. Mm -hmm. Now, they looked identical, except for... So, and nobody one. knew what was inside? No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. All the nine times that I tested it, it's as though the one with the opposing magnet field extending out mm -hmm. three feet on each side, I actually measured how, how far big the field is. How big the field was. And on each side of, a rock, that, of one rock, I had a total of six feet. At any rate, the other, the other rock arrived first. Which one arrived first? The, the, one, the one that had no magnetic field in it. So you were able to cancel out gravity to a certain degree. You were able like to that? cancel, Precisely. reduce the mass gravity effect. Precisely. By, okay. op by opposing fields. Isn't that nice? You, you bet. And got nine signatures and wit. I always skip, you know. You I, did that at Lockheed? What, what year was this? Oh, uh, at least eight years ago. This is um, the actual document of Boyd's where mm -hmm. he proved that by altering the, the field mm -hmm. in a falling body, the magnetic field, it reduced its mass gravity equivalent and canceled out the uh, effects of gravity to a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. And he did a 500, a building 500 drop test conducted from a height of 59 feet mm -hmm. The location is in White Settlement, Texas, and the time was 12.20 p.m., and this was in 1995, December 12th. Nobody yeah. knows this. I know it. So this gravity, is, mass yeah. gravity is not, um, well, it, you can alter it. In well, other gravity, uh, gravity within itself has to have, gravity goes through anything that is solid and anything like iron or anything yeah. else. But, I, but it has to have a magnetic component. Mm -hmm. which may be canceling out within itself. Mm -hmm. But as soon as it got around my rock, it all of a sudden recognized the presence but somebody, of my rock. Uh, one of Einstein's students tried to merge electromagnetism and gravity, and he rejected it. But he didn't have an experiment like you, you know, did. No, I understand. I, yeah. I, I know that. Yeah. But, but, but see, we, you, nature never uses English. It doesn't speak. It doesn't speak any language. But yet it's talking to us all the time. Right. And the key thing is, is to identify, identify what it's saying. Uh, in Anzaburgo State Park. But if, here's, here's one thing, I, if, this makes sense to me. If you can cancel out gravity in a falling body, and you can even reduce a percentage of the effects of gravity for aircraft, it would take less fuel, they would be more oh, efficient. Yeah and they could hover with less energy and and that much I can figure out. And the edge, atmospheric edge of the earth will be meaningless. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see a, a picture of a nuclear powered aircraft? Oh, yeah. What's the date on this one? I refuse to say, but there's the nuclear pile that actually flew. 
bat hunk a junk right there flew? It actually was in the belly providing. Uh, oh, that was in the belly of that. That's right. It's just like in the belly of a submarine. Providing anti-gravity. So it's shaped like an aircraft. Well. It's aerodynamic. <laughs> <laughs> so that we don't think that it's it's not using its wings. Well, but I, mean, I get it. It has an energy source, okay. I understand. And it, and it is staying in the and and here's what oh, it, oh here's God. what it looked like down inside of the protective. It, it was. And that's at Area 51. No, no, <laughs> much closer than we'd care to admit. Oh, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, Lockheed's of the contracts here was in the paper this morning. Twenty-seven billion dollars in the last, you know, couple of years. Most of the, the majority of the defense contracts are here in Texas with Lockheed. I mean, well, certainly. Much. No, no. I, yeah. I, that's why I don't mind having a retirement from them. I just love Boyd so much. He's um, a really charming individual, but um, one of the things he told me before we go back into differentials and the secret to anti-gravity that he just gave us is that it's really hard to understand this, that in 1927 at the fifth Solvay Conference on Quantum Mechanics, all of our greatest physicists were working on mind over matter before World War I and II came along. Heisenberg and Niels Bohr came to Einstein because they said it looks like the minds of the researchers are affecting the results of the quantum experiments because every time a different researcher did the experiments they got different results. And all of a sudden the war came along, World War I and II, and all of these guys had to work on weapons and bombs. And then at the end of the Cold War with Russia, all of a sudden they all went back to their favorite science which is mind over matter. Boyd has told me of course, he's a weapon scientist. He has, has missiles that can pull 800 Gs that are completely classified. And he, we have weapons that are shooting down the ETs, actually, um, that, that have been revealed to me and are very, very powerful. They're way beyond missiles and bullets and anything you can imagine. That's one of the reasons in Mexico you get so many UFOs, because they don't have these beam weapons down there. But nevertheless, going back to what Boyd was showing us, did you see that crane lowering that massive chunk of steel into that little white? I've never even seen that airplane. And, you know, Boyd has been at Lockheed for 20 years, working on the B-1, the B-2 bombers, and many people have you know, said in the UFO community that those planes are using anti-gravity. Well, you're right. They are. And that particular white plane you just saw, I don't even know the name of that plane. But you know that much steel can't fly in that plane, not in the cargo bay, not anywhere. And what's actually happening is two electromagnets with nuclear power are slamming into each other to produce anti-gravity. Remember his experiment with the two north-north face magnets, and he wraps it around the rock, and it falls slower than gravity pulls an ordinary rock. Well, they amplified that. But guess what that actually looks like? Clockwise, anti-clockwise. If some of you remember in science class, if you took a nail and you wrapped copper wire clockwise around it and ran electricity through it, you got a magnet. Okay, now let's do two magnets clockwise. To you, this is counterclockwise, right? Now spin one of them around because you're going to slam the fields together and one is clockwise and the other is anti-clockwise. That's exactly what's appearing in the crop circles. That's exactly what my vision as a little kid was about when I saw the UFO. That's how they do it. And if you really look closely, that Lockheed is in Texas. And Boyd has told me things that would just you know, blow everybody's minds. I mean, things that maybe we're not even in this community prepared to really understand that are happening. We have an alternative space program. A lot of the UFOs we're seeing, especially in Texas, are ours. Why was the Stephenville UFO pursued by Lockheed fighter jets? And they never fired on it. They didn't use the weapon. And you're going to learn about the weapon near the end that shot down the Roswell Flying Saucer. They didn't use anything. Why would, why wouldn't they, if it was really extraterrestrial and we have this super weapon that I'm going to tell you about later, why wouldn't they use it? Because they didn't need to, because it was ours. 
And I know that's hard to believe we have mile-wide triangles at Lockheed, but if you look at all of Lockheed's jets, they're all triangles, they're all black triangles. We just can't imagine, and in, in the Phoenix flights, where did it stop? Right over Goodyear, Arizona. Guess who's, under, guess, guess who's at Goodyear, Arizona? Lockheed Martin. So Lockheed Martin's name keeps coming up. In fact, even Miriam Delicato, if she's in the audience, knows that people have approached her. It's, it all goes back to Lockheed. And this is the man. This is, this is Boyd Bushman. This is the man who studies everything in ufology, who knows this stuff is going on. And these guys built our fastest planes, the F-22. I mean, incredible planes, and there are planes that we have that we're not even allowed to know exist. But the truth is in this differential relationship between clockwise and anti-clockwise. Let's, let's play the next clip of Boyd Bushman, please. Trees and things, and then the light flicked off. As I conducted uh, tests, every now and then nature would not give us what we wanted but it gave us something else. Something else. And I would sweep it under the rug because it didn't match theory. So do you and after a while I said that is not honest. Mm -hmm. That is not proper. Mm -hmm. You have to, you must record the data properly. And, and indeed, once you record the data, then you start modifying the theory. Einstein's work is only a slight modification of Newton's work. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, but we, we, we do understand that uh, Newton's work has, well, Newton's work, for example, Newton says, uh, This is uh, my one. Says, uh, says, anything that's in motion tends to remain in motion, mm -hmm. right? Oh, okay, so I have something, and I'm taking it, I'm taking it around counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. And see, it, and, and what Newton said is true. It just wants to go around, 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 around. This particular thing is called a celt. It is not, it's clear plastic, there's nothing in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to take it around clockwise. It says, no, I don't want to do that. It's just like my children. I will do it my own way. How did it go the other way? Precisely. A Newton's law. Is that because of the rotation of the planet or? Well, there's, there are, try that? you may. In fact, first so, of all, I'll send it around counterclockwise. Okay. And this is called this is called a cell. It is celt, C E L T. What's in it? Okay, okay, there we go. Nothing's in it. It's plastic. Okay, now take it around clockwise. Okay. And it says no. I and it goes back the same number of turns you sent. Oh, well, I've never seen now anything go, like now, that. Now go out stronger. I know. See, I'm looking for the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. You have to. You have to. If you can use language, you really need to convert it into mathematics yep. and calculate what your theory would say that it would do. My theory is, like I've looked at, and on yeah. that CD I sent you, in bubble chambers, yes. if you look at, they have a lead sheet in this particular photograph. Mm -hmm. Super high frequency gamma strike the lead sheet and through the photoelectric effect give off mm -hmm. electron-anti-electron pairs. Mm -hmm. And there's two sets of pairs. and the the electron mm -hmm. has a longer wavelength and the anti-electron positron has a shorter wavelength, mm -hmm. which means there's a differential mm -hmm. between the electron and anti-electron pairs, which means one is stronger than the other, if you convert it through a Planck formula or even an Einstein formula. Well, so you're and that means one of the uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise, the, the differential between them would be one is stronger in mass energy equivalent. Mm -hmm. The other, like for example, well take, the, that, yeah. well, take that with you, and when you get together with your friends you, that agree with you, mm -hmm. have them do the math, and I would like a copy of the math. There's back. a different... It took me many years to get Boyd the math, and I have it. <laughs> and you can see that in the Earth, the, the light little piece of plastic, that's actually called a celt, because they found them in ancient England, as in Celtic. And they even found them in Egypt, they were called rattlebacks. And they're so light, you can't do this with a quarter. They reveal that clockwise and anticlockwise aren't equal in the Earth's field of gravity. That there's a differential between them. And the simple differential is you're standing on the Earth right now, or sitting on the Earth, I'm standing, and the Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, and we don't get thrown off like a washing machine, right? Counter to this centrifugal force of the spin is gravity pulling in. Between the two, 
we actually weigh something. If they were both equal, we would weigh nothing. That's proof of differentials right there. But now we found it all the way down to the atom itself. And we know that that's the secret because it looks like gravity is stronger counterclockwise than it is clockwise. So that gives me a key and how to reverse engineer UFOs. And you're going to see real UFOs in the end, and I'm going to prove this to you. Because we already know from Boyd's testimony that this is how it works. And you think of all the cases in Texas, like the Betty Cash um, case, where there was all this radiation, radiation burns. And you know that Boyd was showing us they were using nuclear energy to slam the fields together to produce a little bit of anti-gravity in the early days. And we're, you know, we're way past that now. And of course, that's why anyone who got near these things got radiation burns. But the real UFOs, you don't get burned. You know, I didn't get burned. So this is where we're going to turn sacred geometry on its ear, literally on its ear. And that's because man-made geometries are symmetrical and perfect. And in nature, geometries are not. In nature, you're actually going to see where the differential is and the numerical codes to how to find the answer to anything you want to manifest. Not, not attract, manifest. If you look at this natural six-sided quartz from above, you can notice that um, across this way, it's like a vesica Pisces. It's, it's an elliptical shape. It's not a, a circle. Whereas the man-made one, this side and this side and this side and this side are equal. And what I do, because Everything in the quantum universe spins clockwise and anticlockwise. I'm going to take measurements in millimeters and centimeters, very accurate, better than inches and quarter inches and so forth. And I'm going to do math clockwise and anticlockwise. And you're going to see the hidden harmonic code that created this crystal. And you can, if you take a copy of this paper, which you can get from my table, you'll be able to learn how to do this on crop circles anywhere you want. Because there's something deeper in crop circles. There's hidden harmonic codes. You just have to learn how to do it. And it's not very hard math. So we notice that two of the sides on this quartz crystal are both four centimeters. This is the actual size of the crystal. And the next side on the right is 3.3 .3 centimeters, 3.6, 4.6, and 3.7. So what I do is I divide four into four, and I get a one. And then I'm going to divide 3.3 .3 into four, 3.6 into 3.3, .3, et cetera, and then counterclockwise and look at the numbers. And the numbers are not random. If we go to the top, I'm not going to give you too much math, so, so don't worry. But you notice that the two four sides cancel out into one. The next math, 4 divided by 3.3, .3 produces 1.2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Infinities of 12s. And how could that happen? Why not just 1.698492 like crazy numbers? Why such perfect harmonies? The next number is 3.3 divided by 3.6. I get 0 0.91666666. This is not an accident. And then I get a random number. When I divide 3.6 by 4.6, we get 7, 0 0.78260. OK, now that looks random. But then the next one, 4.6 divided by 3.7, I get 1.24324343. OK, and I found, no matter what I measured, and then I go counterclockwise, the second paragraph. And I get these uh, 4 divided by 3.7, 108, 108, 108. There's 108 names of God. There's 108 degrees between the, the, the oxygen and the hydrogen atom in water. And that number is, is a mystical number. There's 108 names of God, but there's also 108 beads on your Catholic mall and also in the East Indian malls because of the of the harmonics of that number. Why is that number showing up in a crystal in the harmonic codes? Well, what I found is that when I make my electromagnets cross each other's paths counter-rotational, they have to be in code, or you will not produce zero-point energy or anti-gravity. And literally, these um, are everywhere. Now, this is amazing. Um, I have this CD at my table. I actually. Thanks to Pythagoras, the great Greek mathematician and the father of trigonometry, which um, can really bend your, your head and make you hurt, but um, he discovered that all the planets were producing music, harmonies. And you can only get a vibrational sound when you have waves that oppose each other and vibrate together in sets. So we expose the NASA actual sound of the sun, which sounds 
exactly as the ancient Hindu said, the true sound of Om is the sound of the sun. In fact, there are many cultures that actually describe this, even the native Indian cultures, of the actual sound vibrations of nature. And if, for those of you who know the Masaru Emoto effect, we expose the sound of the sun to water and instantaneously flash froze the water and the symmetry is beautiful. So what I did is on each crystal, I measured from the center, which is a double dodecahedron, all the way to the perimeter, I measured in centimeters, just on a scale model, um, and I got different numbers, different radiuses. And when I did the same math, counter-rotational, I got these incredible, coherently beautiful numbers. Starting with the first one, we divide side one by side two, which is 10.5 by 11, I get 0 0.9545454, and those go to infinity. What Archimedes called infinities is, is when you tune into these, these absolutely perfect vibrations, everything starts happening like magic. Unimaginable things. Everywhere I saw it, 9.5 by 11, 0 0.86363636. And I got, what's interesting in the water crystal on the sound of the sun is I got two sets of random numbers and four sets of coherent numbers. And two goes into four two times, so it's a ratio of one to two. Wasn't well, it interesting that water is one part oxygen and two parts hydrogen? That's a ratio of one to two. And when I went counterclockwise, I got something even more amazing. Counterclockwise, if you see down here, I've got um, 11 divided by 9.5 produces random numbers. But inverted 9.5 divided by 11, I get 0 0.8836836363636. So those numbers are not just crazy science. Those are the harmonic, harmonic codes that caused water to manifest. Our sun is made mostly of hydrogen, a little bit of oxygen, and minerals, and it produces nuclear fusion. If we knew that the sound of the sun may be the missing secret to nuclear fusion, we'd have an abundantly phenomenal endless energy supply. In fact, at NASA, they're now actually studying the sound of the sun, and they realize that, in fact, I've talked to Boyd Bushman because I sent him a paper on this, that the sound that the sun produces may be harmonically arranging the atoms to prepare them for nuclear fusion. Why is it that our nuclear fusion reactors, and I worked in this field for over 10 years, can produce temperatures way hotter than the sun's core, which is about you know, 27 million degrees at the core, we can produce 500 million degrees, even billions of degrees, and we still can't fuse hydrogen. Why? Our bodies are made of the same stuff as the sun, hydrogen, oxygen, and minerals. We're the same thing. Now, when you understand this, that it's really about the hidden harmonic codes to produce infinite energy, nuclear fusion, anti-gravity, you just have to study what the codes are. And in the real crop circles, I'm going to be able to do this math and decode all of them if I could get a, you know, some perfect dimensions on them. But I believe with, this, with these code numbers, I can make it rain. That's what I predict. Anywhere. Because these are the... Remember when you looked at the quartz crystal? The, there's two waves that interfaced that... In fact, Marcel Vogel, who invented the um, early hard drive systems at IBM, what they did is they filmed crystals forming from their liquid state to their solid state but they used invisible cameras that can see into the ultraviolet. And what they saw is like a hologram, these beautiful waveforms counter-rotational each other, to each other were producing a harmony. Then the crystal would manifest, and then the waves would leave as if they were intelligent, just like crop circles. Now, those waves interact with each other in a perfect harmonic set. And then you get a manifestation, a crystal. So that tells me that there's no accident to what Jesus did in the manifestation of the 153 fish and the ratio to a vesica Pisces. He's speaking light years ahead of his time. That the secret to the manifestation, to moving anywhere we want in the universe, are these hidden harmonic codes. Now, I did a little experiment with the golden mean, which is the perfect um, rectangle, which you can see at the bottom of the screen over here. The height is 1.6 one eight times that of the width, which is one, in ratio. And all I did is did the math clockwise and anti-clockwise, and I found the flaw. 1.618 in all the decimal series to seven divided by one produces exactly the same.
But if I invert the math counterclockwise, one divided by the same, I have a difference in the last decimal series of an eight, three eights instead of eight, eight, seven. So I proved there was a differential in the golden mean. A differential, they're not, it's not equal. Now, once again, notice the, if you turn this quartz crystal sideways, it's, an, it's elliptical, and just like the Cherenkov radiation. Very interesting, right? And of course, fractals. In fact, the last time I was at this conference, which was over 10 or 12 years ago, there was a brilliant lecture about fractals. Fractals all use the golden mean. And we do get a lot of beautiful symmetry and understanding of the creation of the universe through the Mandelbrot set. But what I'm saying is, there are dozens and dozens of hidden harmonic codes that are beyond the golden mean, and that the golden mean has a differential, which will revolutionize fractals. Now here, this is a spiraling muon. It's just a, every particle has an antiparticle. But what I love about this little particle is it helps explain, ever, anybody ever seen a UFO make a sharp right angle turn at incredible speed? Okay, or seen video of it. Well, this pink line is a decaying muon spiraling infinitely into a smaller orbit and it has quite a bit of mass, meaning it has a lot of weight. And suddenly, right here, it turns right and, tr and loses most of its mass and turns on a dime and goes into a completely different, it actually transforms into an electron. Now I look at these little things because they can help me explain how these UFOs are working. Now this gets a little more complicated, so I'm going to skip that. And this is, a, this is an example, I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen one of these. These actually grow outwards. They spiral outwards as they're being created. But if we come over here and we compare the length of A, A is going to have a way shorter wavelength than, than um, B, which is a much longer wavelength. Between them, you have a harmony of differentials which is really amazing because as they're growing out, notice this arrow here, the bubble is moving inwards. It's, pull, it's, it's creating like a vacuum cleaner. It's actually sucking in mass and gaining its mass so that it can grow by producing a differential set, which I believe, going all the way back to these subatomic particle spins, if you look at the black hidden space between the spirals, that is the opening of a true circle, where in these differential sets, matter is manifesting out of dark matter to create more energy, which can explain for why the universe is expanding. And that if we know these harmonic sets, we can create infinite zero-point energy. Well, it turns out that, of course, you know, we've seen the evidence in the crop circles of the counter-rotational spins. We saw in um, my swimming pool, that the counter-rotational spins can produce sacred geometries in the interference patterns. And we can actually, if we look at this circle, the kind of math that I do is I measure the, the diameter of the circle and I measure the diameter from center to center of these other rings of circles because Barbara Lamb told us these are all going counterclockwise and this circle is going clockwise to get the math on the harmonic code of what the ETs are actually trying to tell us and this one is just so consistent with what Boyd Bushman told us. The flying saucers are using, remember, electromagnets when they're facing each other and they're the same pole, either north or south, two of them, one through the space will look counterclockwise and the other one will be clockwise. And if you flip this lid over and close it, you'll have a differential set of clockwise, anticlockwise vibrating into each other to produce anti-gravity. So, can we um, play the next video? Um, we're going to get to... Um, in crop circles, you have one lay of grass spinning clockwise and one lay of grass spinning anticlockwise. The, the dual function is always there. But the differential, right in here, the differential, one is higher in frequency than the other is where I believe the graviton actually is. Have you ever thought of actually building a, a craft itself that could levitate? Oh, yes. Actually, I have a lot of ideas on that. And I think the potential in that is pretty high. Actually, what do you think would happen if you built a 
flying saucer and he started flying around Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> if I build a flying saucer flying around Vancouver, I am sure that... Oh my. There'd be a lot of excitement. Oh yeah. I mean, big excitement. And probably the police and everybody else again would be chasing me down. Oh, they would think it's extraterrestrials. Yeah, they might start shooting at me. They might start shooting at you and then they'd find out it's you. Oh my God, it's John. Yeah, it's John and what do we do now? He actually did it. John Kenneth Hutchison actually built a flying saucer. I think the realm of it is quite probable since I was studying some of the older experiments done by T. Brown, hmm. Poddle Enough, and those folks. And what's interesting about Poddle Enough is that uh, the uh, anti gravity effects seem to go right down the earth all the way up to an unknown area. Has anybody ever threatened your life? I mean, as mm. far as like trying to possess what you have here? I mean, seeing it as a threat has anyone ever like you know threatened you and said that you know you're on to something and you're not allowed to be doing this and mm, no major threats um, mostly people saying well you should work for the US government that's um, a lot of emails I get are like that and that they're ready and willing to stand by and give the funding out uh, but I've never been threatened. I've been also approached by religious groups saying, well, my duty is to continue on with this and make it a practical system. Yeah, I mean, if you can levitate an iceberg, you could end a drought. I mean, you could land in a dry lake bed. You could change <laughs> architecture. The work that Hutchings has been doing, mm -hmm. he has Tesla coils, he has Van de Graaff, and he has, mm -hmm. very frankly, static electricity generators. Mm -hmm. Notice that data doesn't have to make sense. Right. Data just has to be truthful. The, the, the truth. That's right. It's more important than proving Einstein right or wrong. Okay, now, now, now his, his data showed everything from a, a chocolate milkshake snaking toward the top of his room mm -hmm. uh, to bowling balls floating in the air mm -hmm. to I, I have all his data and I've been and I, I've been uh, you know, following it. I am a senior scientist from Lockheed Martin. I have been a senior research engineer for Howard Hughes, Texas Instruments. Nevertheless, uh, we've been uh, we've been working for some time now in order to determine where the next energy levels are going to come from. We. Uh, now, by that, I mean that we aren't talking about wind or solar or or even atomic. We have uh, we have we have other formats of energy that uh, that we've theoretically proven that are uh, that are available. Not only that, but uh, there have been significant developments, and many times the things that we look at and call UFOs are really some of some of the developments that we've been involved with. That, that Lockheed has been involved with? Some of the UFOs we're seeing, you believe, are ours? They're United States military? Well, Area 51 uh, is literally where the majority of the uh, things that we call the black program mm -hmm. were developed. And uh, many times sightings would occur directly associated with them. So you had a number of sightings and then... The I think what Boyd is saying is very profound because we know from Ben Rich, the former head of, of Lockheed Skunk Works, and it was actually thanks to MUFON um, attendees at his lecture at U University of Southern California that they recorded him saying that, and now we have double confirmation from one of their senior research scientists that this t it would take an act of God to get this technology out to benefit humanity. My goal is to get the ecology movement to mer merge with the UFO movement to really understand that we need a Congress. We need our Congress to become the UFO Congress to extract the best technologies we have to get us off of foreign oil. So moving on here, 
Jeff Willie's footage, and you can see Jeff Willie's footage here, really interests me because I studied it frame by frame. And it looked a lot like, and I noticed the flying saucer was on its side, which means the occupants are not affected by gravity at all. And this is kind of a video frame of, of his flying saucer. And he had two sightings, May 24th, 2003 and May 24th, 2005. And the 2005 video, I pulled into my you know, high definition editing bay and I was amazed. Now firstly, his camera shoots with interlace frames. There's two frames that interlace to produce one image of video. And because he's hand holding it, luckily we got a little bit of a staggered image. And what's in the center of it, you can see right through the UFO. And what do we see? We see light shining off of the edge of what to me looks like a concave Tesla coil and the ghost-like image of the UFO. The reason we can see right through the center of it is because it's producing a lot of ultraviolet and x-rays which go through solid objects. But right here, very faintly, we see a wider Tesla coil ghost-like impression superimposed right over the other one. And this really interests me because I did some rough measurements on the diameter of one versus the other. And I actually got a ratio that was very close to the golden mean. And I mean, this gets really advanced. It's very clear that, you know, John Hutchison's levitating cannonball, he's using Tesla coils in precise sets. And that's why he gets anti-gravity, and that's why Lockheed Martin is interested in him. And here we're looking right like an x-ray machine through a UFO, and we're seeing two Tesla coils stacked on top of each other in different ratios. Now, I noticed something really remarkable about this footage. I know a lot more about this footage than I'm willing to tell tonight. But no one's ever made a concave Tesla coil. You have to understand that Tesla coils produce radio waves. Radio waves are like light waves. They're the same thing. They're just lower energy. The concave Tesla coil will lens or compress the radio waves. I realized that when Boyd Bushman at Lockheed were slamming the two fields together, they were converting all of their energy into radio waves and losing it, throwing it out into space. But because this UFO is lensing, it's radio waves, you can recycle it right here. And which is no coincidence why these things are saucers. Because right here is another circle at the rim. And you can actually recapture those radio photons and recycle them. Now, I've been doing some work with Billy Meyer lately and, um, uh, in Switzerland. And these photographs are very old. It's a huge story between the fake and the real Meyer photos because they tried to trick Jim Modillatoso. Sherwin McLean and Lee and Britt Elders as to, to see if he could prove which ones were the real ones. This one is a real one. Notice on the bottom, the ratio of probably the impressions of what's inside are two different coils. So I did some math. And I divide this coil into this coil and actually the rim of the UFO and look at the numbers I get. Once again, I get over here, 11 divided by 23, I get random numbers, but reversed, I get 2.09090909. And then I divide 23 divided by 39, and I get random, inverse, I get random. And then I divide 39, the width here, by 11, this dimension here, and I get 3.5454544, etc. So then I took another one of these UFOs, and this is one of my favorite ones, and I'm convinced these are real. You know, we can talk about that later. I measured in ratio the diameter of this section, this line, by the different dimensions of the coil, and I got incredible harmonic key, harmonic numbers. I got 0 0.6666, 1.16666, and down here I get 0 0.46666, 0.2666, so come on, this is not an accident. This is not an accident. This thing is real. And these harmonic codes can actually be duplicated in the lab. And what I've done, just to start, this is actually a little bit of a, an amazing detour, is the first thing I did is I wanted to do some experiments, and, and by coincidence, I was interested in the power of stones. And um, my partner, Lee, and Dave Vetti in Sedona, and Jan Vetti, and I came together with this idea that we could charge some of these harmonic frequencies on stones. We actually test them on the human body. And some of these stones, interestingly enough, are the same 
is with the ancient Anunnaki. For those of you who read Zechariah Sitchin, the earliest gods who came to earth were wearing these things all the time. According to Sitchin, these stones kept vibrational energies and information and blueprints in something very similar to what we call a computer disk. And this is the ancient god Marduk from the 18th century BC. And notice on his wrist, he's wearing all these circles around his neck. And you'll notice I'm, I'm wearing one of them too. We actually charged these. I actually found that certain stones have vibrational, they're like hard drives. You can store actual harmonic vibrations in them. And what we did, what I did that really interested me is I found also, this was in Smithsonian Magazine just this past September. They found that when they excavated the site, they find the skeletal remains of a lot of people with a lot of physical problems that came to be healed by the stones. And now we can scientifically prove that stones can not only be levitated by harmonic codes, they can actually hold harmonic vibrations. And we see evidence of the, of the stone worship in all of our religions, the Philosopher's Stone, the Kaaba in Islam. I mean, on and on and on it goes. I'm just going to take you through this really fast. So what I found was using these harmonic set generators, which are proprietary, I've developed a new type of Tesla coil. And um, we, we use a toroid because it's probably the best contender for the shape of the universe right now, probably more a multi-dimensional toroid. And if you noticed in the swimming pool, the interference patterns in the end produced a toroid. They store um, energy forms really well. And the true shape of the Earth is actually the magnetic fields of the Earth is actually a toroid, a donut, once again. The human body's energy field forms the torus. The human eye is the torus with a hole in the middle, flowers, on and on and on it goes. So what we've done is, let me just skip ahead here. Oh, Marcel Vogel at IBM found that crystals may become the hard drives of the future because they've been able to store a movie at Stanford University of the Mona Lisa and a hummingbird in the same crystal and just like a DVD, they can play it any time they want. So this looks like an ordinary stone, but actually it's been treated and infused with healing vibrational energies that affect all of our chakras and our energy field of our body. And what I did is I took a simple, um, I'm not going to be able to go through all of this, but um, took a simple voltmeter measuring in millivolts. And I measure the electricity of my body, which at that moment is actually pulsing is 4.4 millivolts. And some of you have experienced this if you've come by my booth. But when I hold on to a plain stone that's charged, suddenly I'm almost at 30 millivolts. Where did the extra energy come from? How did it, how did it appear? It's, it can't be happening. You know, my body has... And then on the wrap pieces that we actually wound in consistency with the patterns of the way subatomic particles move, I went up to 108 on this particular day. And why, once again, did the ancient Anunnaki wear these things around their necks and around their wrists? Because according to Zechariah Sitchin, they're from a different star system, a different planet, and they actually have to protect the energy fields of their body. So I took the sound of our star system from NASA, just like I showed you on the water crystal, and I put it in our pendants and actually can actually keep it there, just like a DVD, so that when your bioelectricity connects with this, it raises your, your actual vibration. Of course, the native Indian peoples of the Americas described the stone as the stone peoples because they were history keepers and energy keepers. They know more about ancient and modern stone technology than we can imagine. So there's Marduk. So this is kind of stage one for me at reverse engineered technology. But in my own experience in treating these stones, some accidents happened in my lab where I believe, and I have to verify this, I have more energy coming out of the system than is going into it. And the energy that radiates off of my new Tesla technology that's proprietary is so powerful that when I point my electromagnetic field meters at it, it destroys them because I'm producing so much energy. And that is because I'm tuned into a harmony. Now, the other thing is interesting is that the HeartMath Institute in California, they found that the heart is electromagnetic. Oh, I wasn't supposed to do that. Okay. The heart produces electromagnetic field. With the hundreds and hundreds of satellites orbiting our Earth, we're actually being affected and being thrown out of our natural rhythm in our heart because of all this interference. Military broadcasting and mind control, radio, television. I mean, it's insane. So another reason... I believe for wearing these pendants is that they can actually protect us. 
And as I was doing this, accidentally, something happened in the lab. Mysterious and powerful things happened in the lab that may be over unity. So I'm always corresponding with Boyd Bushman at Lockheed because unfortunately, you know, from years and years of me, you know, making my films and doing this stuff, I always hope to, to finance and get my own anti-gravity lab and do it in secret. But unfortunately, that has never happened. And unfortunately, it is... I know people who claim to have done anti-gravity on their own and been abducted and confiscated by the military. So how do, we, how do we, in the end, release this technology to the world? How do we do this so that we can end oil addiction and get off fossil fuels? I want to play the last video segment for you. Um, can we play the last segment of Boyd Bushman? Because this is just really incredible. Do we have the last one? Roswell. Because I knew you were coming, I again got called a friend of mine mm -hmm. who was a Navy doctor mm -hmm. during the same time period we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Slightly after that, and he all of a sudden was healing a pilot, mm -hmm. a person that had been pilot. He began to tell him a story and he basically said, one day I was up, I was up in one of the, uh, the, the faster airplanes that we had, and I had something that was a spherical object that, that was ahead of me. And I called back and I said, are there any, are there any friendlies over here? Mm -hmm. He actually took off from a Texas location, Head, uh, headed off that way. And uh, towards New Mexico. And he... Uh, he said, they said, well, no, there's no friendlies here. He said, not only that, but he's accelerating away from me, and yet I have the fastest airplane that's been designed. And Which at that time was... And therefore, it can't be one of us. Well, that was... And he said, well, they said, well, you have the, you have the, you have the weapon on board. It was a new design. Oh. And he said, go on ahead and shoot it down. And so he did. He shot down the Roswell craft. Do you know who did it? He said, "Don't tell. I didn't, don't give the people my name, nor 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 and give you them, know this nor guy? Give, no, he certainly. He shot it down. He's, he's a very dear the, the doc. With the, what kind of a the doc, weapon? The doctor is a very dear friend of mine. What what kind I, of a weapon? I don't know. We we have all kinds. Because bullets things. were only fifteen hundred miles an hour back we, then. We we have all kinds of things out there. <laughs> An electromagnetic pulse. So we had Anyhow. Nikola Tesla died in the Hotel New Yorker on July 7th, coming into the morning of the 8th in 1943. Freedom of Information Act request, F FBI, FOIA documents reveal that Tesla's death ray was the only defense we had against atomic bombs. And the question is, as these documents reveal, the secrecy around the Tesla death ray which is a laser weapon used to strike at an aircraft as a ray to short circuit all of its electrical systems, all of the spark plugs, all of the engineering in the craft to actually down the craft. The question is, is the Tesla death ray the weapon that was used that Boyd Bushman's testimony tells us to take down the flying saucer at Roswell? Because we know from the dates that the Tesla death ray was being developed in 1943 by the United States government. And the Roswell craft appears in our skies in 1947 in July, that there's plenty of time to have developed the weapon that we shot down the, them at well, Roswell. Well, then the individual said that he went and landed at a nearby airport, went over and went and walked into the craft. Evidently, one of them was out walking around because there were only three when he was in. Three aliens at that time? And he walked in and they were all four feet and under. But he could see through the walls of the craft from the inside out. Whoa. And it kind of... Translucent and, material. And, and, and the material he was stepping on was spongy, he said. 
It, it, it wasn't. So what about this liquid wall at Roswell? Well, if you will follow your friend and mine, Lazar, he didn't. They didn't find any light bulbs, any electricity, or any requirement for such a thing. I mean, that's pretty powerful testimony, considering who we're we're talking to. To clarify, his friend is a Navy doctor who treated the young pilot who was given the orders in a post-World War II environment. We didn't know if they were the Japanese, the Russians. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know they were aliens. But if you follow the FBI files, you'll find there were sightings all over this country after the war. And we didn't know of who they were. Russians, Germans, China, we don't know. So this young pilot shoots it down and he's being traded for radiation burns. And the Tesla death ray, which was, according to Tesla, could melt an aircraft engine from 250 miles away, was very advanced at that time, and is obviously the weapon that was used, but you can't even imagine what we have today. I'm not even allowed to talk about it. And that's why the UFOs are all in Mexico, because they're, they're scared, I mean, they're scared of us. And what interests me about this particular craft is they never fired back. Even in the Battle of 42 over Los Angeles, the ETs never fired back. Well, when we fly missions to Mars and satellite missions around the solar system, we don't arm our satellites and our, our spacecraft. And there have been incidences of where we've lost satellites because they've been shot at by extraterrestrials. So why would an extraterrestrial race that would, you know, you're coming to Earth and it's like, oh, well, you guys, here we are. And what I believe actually happened, I have 29 minutes remaining, that's great. This is what I really believed happened at Roswell. This is very science fiction. Because it all comes full circle, back to the kids. Why did the ETs appear to kids all over the United States, give them the same blueprints to build flying saucers out of aluminum, with radio tubes mounted in the middle, and they flew? And while the FBI is investigating in our military big flying saucers from Kenneth Arnold sighting in June near Mount Yakima in Washington to the sightings in Idaho by the, by the United Airlines pilot, and then over Portland, Oregon on July 4th, there's nine UFOs over there. Then they're down at Edwards Air Force Base, and then they're at Roswell, and these toy saucers are in the way. What were the ETs doing? And this is what I believe. This is science fiction. I can't prove this. It's intuitive. We detonated the first atomic bomb at Trinity Site, New Mexico on July 22nd, 1945. And then we detonated over Nagasaki and Hiroshima in um, August of that same year. Now it's interesting that two years later, there are several flying saucer crashes on all sides of Trinity. Roswell's, you know, over 100 and something miles to the east. Then there's a saucer crash near there. Then there's the plains of St. Augustine. Why all these saucer crashes and why? There's three of them. And the number of UFOs that were seen with Kenneth Arnold in Yakima, Washington was nine, over Portland, Oregon was nine, and over Edwards Air Force Base was nine on July, I think Edwards Air Force Base is around July the 9th or 10th. And the crash at Roswell is around the 7th or the 8th, et cetera. Stanton Friedman knows better than, than I do on that. Well, what if the ETs could see that in the future, we were gonna destroy ourselves and destroy the planet? And they would, they would, at the moment of that explosion, whether it tore a fabric in the hole of space-time and they came through it, and slowly the hole was closing and they only had so much time. This is a little bit science fiction for you. And they were visiting these children, just like in a Spielberg movie, and downloading the blueprints to these kids, hoping that one of them would grow up with the answer to this technology so that in the future, we wouldn't be using nuclear energy we wouldn't be burning fossil fuels and destroying our... I mean, even if you don't believe in global warming, who doesn't like clean air and clean water? Destroying our rivers and our streams in South America because of all these oil companies. What if the ETs, the positive ones, gave the children the messages, hoping one of them would grow up and deliver this technology? Now, I'm not saying it's just me. I'm one of them. I probably didn't even get as, enough, as much information as these kids did that successfully flew flying saucers. But where did they end up? Can you imagine their families when they get this, the men in black show up at the door and say, I mean, we have to take your, actually the boy who built the flying saucer that crashed in North Hollywood worked at Chevron, 16 years old. Where do these kids end up? I mean, 
there must have been in some kind of an arrangement where they ended up in, in the you know early you know Convair and Boeing in the early days. And, and and in my film from here to Andromeda, there's many more of Boyd Bushman and many other fascinating people on the subject of UFOs. Where did these kids end up? That's what I want to know, because the message still hasn't reached the masses. It still hasn't reached the masses, and it still hasn't saved us from destroying ourselves. I believe there, are, you know, thanks. I mean, in Boyd Bushman's courage, considering who his employer is, and that they could take away his pension. Lockheed is the biggest defense, bigger than Boeing when it comes to, you know, the Air Force and, and, the, and the aircraft they built. He's risking it all to come into this community from a corporate level, a man who has a background in weapons. And he's told me, my weapons have killed, I can't even tell you how many people. So it, to me, it was almost like looking in the eyes of a Darth Vader who had turned to the light, who had seen the light. And before he dies, he wants us to have this. And he sincerely told me, I really, he really wants humanity to have this technology so we can save ourselves. The problem is, at the congressional level, even Obama's new head of national security, national security advisor, James L. Jones, is making investigations into anti-gravity. And I, I heard this reported through, I think, um, the, the ex-people. Um, um, <clears throat> that, and this was in the press, that he found the Byfield Brown effect on YouTube. If a four-star general, and there's only a handful of four-star generals, have to go to YouTube to get information. <laughs> oh my God, I, I have to introduce him to some of the people I know at NASA who are studying this phenomenon, Boyd Bushman and many others. And also I want to say that I get amazing calls and recently my friend, <laughs> Charles Brown disclosed in Stephen Greer's Project Disclosure, he was an amazing ace pilot in World War II. And his life was spared by a German ace pilot. And the two of them eventually met each other. And he advised many presidents on UFOs. And we were really good friends, you know. I don't know why I'm getting emotional, but Charles Brown wouldn't go very public about what he knew about UFOs, but it was his favorite subject. And he was very close to getting a movie deal about his life story, but it never happened. And he recently you know, passed away. And I really cherish a lot of those ex you know, Air Force and military pilots that you know, take the time to write me and we, we talk to each other. And they give me their deepest insights into where I'm headed and convincing me that I'm on the right track. And part of that is what, what keeps me going. But Charles Brown left us uh, recently, and he never got to tell his whole story. And there's many more like him. There's many more Boyd Bushmans in Boeing and Lockheed. And there's many more people like him in NASA. And, and uh, I hope they all start coming forward. And I hope our, our President Obama um, gets a Congress like this Congress. Um, thank you very much. I'll, I'll take some questions. And, and for anybody who's interested in, in my other films, on consciousness studies and physics and some of these pendants. You can see me at my table. But we have about 20 minutes left, so I can take some questions. You got sound? Testing, testing. <laughs> testing, testing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, first of all, like, wow. That was really something. Thank you. I'm probably way out of my league here, but I will have a couple of questions. Are you familiar with the uh, Twin Tower UFO sighting? Oh, yeah. I actually watched that live from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia? Yeah. I uh, was in Saudi Arabia on 9 That was almost certainly a human or a, a human I, There was a couple of CNN clips of, of UFOs near the Twin Towers, and all of a sudden they weren't on scene anymore. They removed them. And actually, Dan Aykroyd um, told me about them. And um, very interesting. That's all I can say about okay. that. Okay. 
are you are you are you comfortable with uh, our ability to scale down this technology to I don't know using a car sort of for personal transportation? Well, the first thing that Boyd Bushman and I talked about was um, yeah, I'm not I'm unplugged. Oh, now I'm back. The, the boy, the first thing that Boyd and I talked about is what if you could take a GM Hummer, a gas guzzler, and put gravity cancellators on all four wheels and cancel out 50% of the weight? Well, the fuel economy would double. You would get uh, maybe 24 miles to the gallon to a Hummer. And what if you canceled out 75% of it? We could all be driving big, luxurious cars. <laughs> And there is some fears about us all flying around like the Jetsons because not all of us know how to fly yet. <laughs> and we'd all be crashing into each other. So that would be stage one. If you can cancel out a lot of the weight charge of gravity, your fuel economies or the different types of even electric cars would be phenomenally powerful. And just one last question. Is it your sense that the recent downing of that plane had anything to do with this, this ray technology? The recent downing oh, oh, of the planes in, in New York, actually there were two yes. cases in New York now. The second case, everybody died. And I think that was upscale. I mean, there's no way, you know, I can't, I always look for scientific proof, you know, I'd want to see the radar. I also understand that electromagnetic field weapons that are beyond scalar are invisible. There's no munition, there's no smoke trail, there's no missile, you can't see them. So they're really the most dangerous weapon of all. In fact, luckily recently, I had a meeting with the Under Secretary of Defense Cohen for Homeland Security in Hollywood, who was educating all these Hollywood producers. I don't know how I ended up at this meeting, but it's a long story. And I, in the end, you know, I, you know, I introduced him to a very important physicist that I used to work with on, on bomb detection for Homeland Security. And then I said, are you aware of electromagnetic weapons or beam weapons that have no munitions? Do you have any understanding that if, if these kind of weapons got into the hands of the wrong people, what could happen? And the subject is simply terrified. I have a question. This is, was a, a great thing. Um, about Nancy Pelosi, are you going to talk to Nancy Pelosi about this Glosher project? And if you do, what would you say to her? Who's Nancy Pelosi? I know I know that name. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know who that is. I, I, She's the Speaker of the House. She's, a, She's the Speaker of the House? Oh my God. Well, what we have to tell her is we want their Congress to come and learn from our Congress. That's what I would say to her. Thank you. Do you, do you know the difference in time on the drop test that was made, uh, one stone hitting soon, sooner than the other? Do you know the difference? They, they did the test nine times because Boyd wanted to confirm at Lockheed, at the tower, the 59-foot tower where they dropped him. But um, the times, I, the exact times, and I was really interested in that because it's only 59 feet, that's not very far. So if you can see a difference in the rate of fall in only 60 feet, that is phenomenal, even if it's visible. But the exact uh, ratios, I don't know, no. I can ask Boyd that. But wouldn't you have to worry about whether it would be air resistance difference? No, because you know that, you know, heavier objects, spherical objects, and they were spherical, both of them. He wrapped a plaster around the north-north magnets, and then another one that looked identical. It would be exactly the same. No, no, in 59 feet, aerodynamics would not, it would not show any change. In fact, you know, let's drop my pen and this little guy here, and we have aerodynamic problems, and they both fall at the same rate here. And on the moon, the feather, fell at the same rate as Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you seem to have linked uh, some of this uh, energy here with uh, the crop circles. And what exactly is the mechanism by which that energy is applied to the crop to make the crop circles? And in connection with that, now there recently apparently have been some rectangular crop circles. They're not all circular. And I've seen also where there's a little bouncing ball of light seems to be associated with those crop circles. Do you, can you comment on any of those? Well, firstly, I rarely talk about this, but I've had encounters with the spheroids right in front of me. I've actually seen them. And I was talking to Bob Brown about this last night, um, actually before I go there. Remember the test in the swimming pool 
The interference patterns at 9 o'clock between clockwise and anticlockwise produce rectangles, triangles, diamonds, all kinds of shapes. So interference patterns, depending on the way they're configured and the timing of the pulses, can produce any geometry you can imagine. Just like the sound of the sun produces beautiful draw geometries in water. You can take chaotic tap water, which, which looks crazy if you flash freeze it, and then you beam the sound of the sun at it and it completely reconfigures. Why the geometries? Because the geometries appear in the harmonic ratios. Precise, you have to, these ratios are very precise. And if you look in the, the incident of Jeff Willie's UFO, and also um, if you look at um, the ratio in the Meyer UFOs, these ratios are so, I mean, they need to be tested. The tests that I've done have produced, I'm convinced that there is over unity happening. Even my little stones can cause your body electricity to, on a little voltmeter, to go higher. Why? Where's the extra energy coming from? Why was I only, you know, four one hundredths of a volt and now I'm a hundred and eight hundredths of a volt? Where does that extra energy come from? It's because, you know, in the zero point field, to, to get to the zero point field, you have to know the language of the harmonies of these codes. But interesting enough, going to the spheroids and the crop circles, I mean, I believe the crop circles are intelligent. W.C. Levengood shared his paper with me, and he's convinced there, is, there are electromagnetic waves that are coming from space somewhere. Whether they're satellites or not, he doesn't know. Whether they're ETs, he doesn't know. Are producing the geometries in the fields and causing the grass to, to, to heat and bend at the nodes. The fake circles are not worth doing any math on. I mean, once you eliminate, if somebody has crunched the grass, then I'm not interested in doing any math on the circle. But if you can at least get to that point, now, the little spheroid beings, and some of them are quite large, this is amazing. Gary Schwartz, a Harvard-Yale psychiatrist who's in my film, The Voice, has the most advanced consciousness studies lab in the nation at the Ari University of Arizona at Tucson. And this is an amazing experience because, you know, one night I went to bed really early, like 9 o'clock, and my wife was just talking to some, some, you know, very positive extraterrestrials. And I had no idea what she was doing. I woke up in the middle of the night because I, I feel this static in my body before I see ghosts and, and beings. I actually see them three-dimensionally because I've been meditating every day for 30 years and, and these things happen when you do this meditation practice. And I saw these little basketball guys, burnt orange and turquoise, and they were moving around like this, three of them spinning around my wife's head and they shot through the ceiling and I went, oh my God, I really saw this. And my friend Joseph Mark Cohen, a, a Jewish Kabbalah teacher, told me that these little spheroids in the crop circles are the Arcturians from the star system Arcturus. Arcturus. And I had already met them before in the same fashion. Spheres speaking to me in perfect English, hovering in my room right in front of me. I know that that sounds like science fiction. But what interests me is Gary Schwartz comes to me and he said, David, when that was in no, this past November, he said at that same week, very shortly before that, the military came to him and had this new ultra-infrared camera. You think of the FLIR cameras in Mexico and how they saw the UFOs, right? And these cameras can see so deep, the new one can see so deep into the invisible infrared in specific strata, very precise areas of the infrared that no camera's ever seen before. It was made by Mitsubishi. And, they, and the military said, Gary, can you help us? Because we're seeing things on this camera we can't explain. And he's a psychiatrist, and he does a lot of research with psychics who see ghosts and phenomena. And he has cameras that can see into the invisible. He said, David, you've got to come to my lecture. Because exactly what you saw, you're going to see on film. A woman who was a trans channeler who was communicating with extraterrestrials, they filmed her with this ultra $700,000 camera. And all of a sudden, not like the two-dimensional orbs you see in the digital cameras, this thing looked like a basketball. And it was moving around just like the guy's eyes saw, woo, 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 like really kind of fun, like a bee, buzzing around her head and whew, took off, exactly as I had experienced. So I was excited about that because it was confirmation in the invisible that these spheroids exist and they are intelligent. And we've all seen, if anybody has seen the good crop circle movies, we've seen the evidence that the little orbs of light can even appear in the daytime and they're probably making the circles and possibly they are from Arcturus or other star systems. So, um, so that's my answer to that question. Now, Gary Schwartz, 
And Bob and I were talking about this last night at dinner. It's very interesting that what if a lot of these consciousness researchers, which we have at Princeton University, the Global Consciousness Project, now this is really interesting. Random event generators are placed all over the planet, and for 20 years they've been testing these things, and they get precognitive signals. They got a signal on 9-11. They produced non-random, coherent numbers moments before 9-11. These random generators can sense the Earth's aura. Remember what I showed you in the math today. Coherent versus random numbers. What do coherent numbers mean? They mean harmonies, synchronicities. Something is about, to, there's a meaning to these numbers. And every single time at Princeton, this is where Einstein taught. They're, they're searching the aura of the planet. The scientists in, in, in Russia, this is mind-blowing technology. There's a new camera that can see the entire aura in three dimensions. It can see how much energy all of our chakras are putting out in real time, how much, uh, how well they're talking to each other, how well aligned they are. And this scientist has four PhDs at St. Petersburg Tech University in Russia, and he's telling me about these new sensors that can see the real-time universe. So if we point our telescope at Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, it's 8.7 light years from Earth, we see it where it was 8.7 years ago. But mathematically, they can calculate where Sirius really is, and it's black, and they point these sensors there, they get a signal. Intelligent signals, they appear. Einstein discovered something called spooky action at a distance, which is instantaneous communication at a distance. Scientists have actually measured communication between little microbes and water dishes on the planet Earth, suddenly go crazy, around eight minutes before a solar flare actually, when a solar flare emits on our sun, it takes over eight minutes for it to get here. They're already reacting to prepare themselves for the solar flare. Now water is hydrogen and oxygen. The sun is hydrogen, oxygen, and minerals, just like water. They're communicating faster than light. So these little water sensors are being tested in Russia, and these guys, forget SETI, forget looking at radio waves. They're not, they're not broadcasting in radio waves. We can use these real-time sensors to make contact with extraterrestrials in real time. And so I, I think it's going to happen. Um, Gary Schwartz and a lot of these researchers are very interested in the UFO phenomena and the ET contact phenomena. And hopefully, some of them will start speaking at this conference. Um, one more question. Could you give us any Well, I've read all of Ze Zechariah Sitchin's books. I mean, I'm a big Zechariah Sitchin fan. Um, one thing that interests me about Nibiru is apparently its orbit is elliptical and counter-rotational to the other planets. And of course, that interests me because it's a differential. But I, I can't say I've seen a lot of um, I've seen a lot of articles on NASA's own website that are pretty stunning. I follow some very interesting things there. All of a sudden, just recently, this was several months back. Earth is being bombarded by super high energy cosmic rays beyond the normal background level. And it's coming from somewhere in a place in space where they're saying there's nothing there. Either, or, or maybe there is something there and they don't want us to know. All of a sudden this extra level of cosmic energy is hitting Earth and NASA knows this. They've never seen anything like it. So, but I, I'm not an expert on, on Nibiru, so I, I mean I'm a big Zechariah Sitchin fan, really huge. So uh, anyway, thank you everybody for attending. And uh, thank you, Bob. Yeah, great. Oh, I gotta grab my book. Thank you, David. David Sarita. Hey, listen, don't.